Okay, so this is the concluding lecture on clustering and classification, and I want to introduce uh, two of the uh, very important concepts left over in support vector machines and what are called classification trees. I'll also highlight uh, some of the other methods we're not going to talk about that are very important in data analysis, and I brought a little friend with me. He's just going to watch over us as we program. So let's talk first about uh, this concept of the support vector machine. Um, basically, a support vector machine is going to be look a lot like our algorithms that we had previously. Uh, it's basically going to find an optimal way to separate data clusters. It is a supervised algorithm, so it means you have a training stage and a test stage. And just like all the other training uh, supervised algorithms out there, it's important that you do uh, a combination of uh, testing with some training set, and then you test a set, and then you, of course, cross-validate that. And that's really important to do that at the end of the routine. Okay, so let me illustrate the ideas pectorally of what the optimization is in support vectors, and then we'll demonstrate it in practice in MATLAB. Okay, so I'm gonna go illustrate this by showing it to you here on this uh, paint. So I'm gonna put up some, uh, some dots here, some data. And we'll look first of all, we'll go back to our, so our example, maybe I have some squares here. So that's one set of data. And I'm going to put another set of data in, uh, which could be another class. And you can do multiple classes just like anything else. And, oh, sure, blue sounds great. Let's make it a light blue. Uh, okay. So let's suppose that these are our two data sets. We have the blue. Uh, as well as this yellow, yellow squares, blue balls, and what we want to do is figure out the optimal way to separate it. Now what we learned previously is that linear discriminants essentially looks for a projection, right? If I were to take some line here, so you're going to project onto some lower dimensional space a line, and on which line would I best separate this data? Well, so there'd be some line here on which you have these distributions, and then you can make basically a linear separator between the data sets, okay? So SVM, or support vector machines, do something a little bit different, which is they're going to do another optimization problem about how to solve this. But the optimization problem is basically one in which they're going to try to find the best fit lines that are going to give the maximal separation between the blue uh, and the yellow. Okay? So you might imagine one set of lines that could potentially do this is here. So there's one. And then here is another set right here. In fact, part of what the SVM does is it looks to construct these lines that are maximally separated. So if I were to look at the line that goes down the middle of this thing, okay, and I can recast that as uh, the line more gen generically like that. There is some line which tries to maximize this width. That is the objective. So you could formulate this as an optimization problem, which is find me the best line that satisfies this. Okay? So it's going to try to make this as thick as possible. Now, a couple things to note. One of the things that we've been talking a lot about is, for instance, in the Gaussian mixture model, you look at the statistics of this. You start thinking about what's the best statistical distribution, a Gaussian distribution of this versus this. K-means or K-nearest neighbors looks at distances between them to do this optimization decision. Here, if you notice, the only points that really matter in drawing this decision line are the ones sitting on the boundary. So I'm going to put a little star here on these points. And these ones with the star define are what are called the support vectors. These are the things that support this decision space. Okay? So that's where you get this idea of support vector machines, which is you're looking for the support, uh, which data points are the support for this optimization. Notice that it doesn't care about these guys anymore. These guys are out there. It's not looking at some statistical distribution and trying to figure out how to draw this. It's trying to say which ones are on the edge, those are the ones I want to draw near, 
Okay? So again, it's a supervised algorithm because I'm telling it that these things here are blue, these things here are yellow, and this theory, then by doing that, I'm looking for those uh, data points that are nearest to this boundary between them and try to do this. Now, of course, a lot of data, the blues go over and the yellows go over. So I still want to try to save this problem, or, or basically do the same problem, and not all data is going to separate like this. And so what you're going to do is any yellow that's over here is going to get penalized. Okay, so if I have a, a blue ball over there, then obviously I cannot even draw such a thing where I clearly get the separation of blue versus yellow. So anything over there is going to get penalized heavily. It's going to be penalized by the distance into the territory it's in. Okay? So that's going to be the basic idea. It's an optimization problem. That's it. And what you can do is you can generalize this technique. One of the most powerful things about this is that it's actually fairly simple to implement. It has um, a lot of theoretical foundations around it, so people can really make some estimates and proofs about how well this thing can work statistically. And also, you can generalize this into higher dimensional spaces using what's called kernel methods. And then, so instead of just projecting this all down into a line in one dimensional space, you can project up in space. And so you can get curved surfaces. Okay, here I've just represented this with a line. But the idea is now you can actually produce curved spaces, which are curved in higher dimension. And as you project down into one space, it gives you uh, a curved surface here. So that's actually a very nice uh, thing because what you would really like to do is have data where the support vector would allow you to separate two clusters. And let me give you an example of what that data might look like. So for instance, uh, one of the powerful things about support vector machines is that you know, in this data here where we're just drawing a line between them, you might say, well, why would I use a support vector machine? I could just do a linear discriminant. But there are some data sets where uh, lines are not going to work. And let me draw you a set here once I'm done erasing. So this is a very intuitive concept. The minimization problem is well is easily defined. And uh, you can basically uh, solve that minimization problem or optimization problem to optimize or minimize the error. And in fact, most of these lines or these decision points between variables are just done exactly that way. You're just looking for some kind of uh, optimal solution to some, some problem you state. Okay, So optimization is part of this. But let me give you some data that SVM can actually do very nicely. So let's go back to an orange pin. Suppose I have a cluster of data here. And suppose I have, I'm going to go to purple now. This is UW colors here. Suppose I have something like this. All right. This might be a data set that you would have. And of course, this is an interesting data set because now what you have is clearly some separation of domains where you have an interior region surrounded by the purple dots. So now this is just a projection in two-dimensional space. This may be coming from some higher dimensional space, but this is what it looked like. And from your naked eye, you can clearly see there's a nice separation. But your decision boundary might look something like this. So anything inside that circle would be orange circles. Anything outside that would be purple squares. Okay? But this is a nonlinear decision curve, which is something you can't access using either uh, a linear discriminant analysis or, uh, or something like uh, quadratic discriminant analysis. Those things are set up specifically to draw lines or parabolas through the data. This is a circle, so it's a nonlinear function. But by the way, k-nearest neighbors could do this for you. Right? So it's not like SVM has some magic. It's the only one that can do things like this. In fact, there's boosting algorithms and things like CanN search, which would allow you to do this. But it's clear what I'd really like to do is be able to construct this in some kind of optimal way. And uh, KNN search doesn't solve an optimization problem, but SVM does. So it's going to give you actually the best separation possible from doing this. OK, so I'm going to execute this SVN on the cat and dog data once again. Just show you how the architecture of the method and how to do it. All right, so let's go out of here, get back to our desktop, and here is our MATLAB program. And 
Oop, okay. We're gonna get right to here. And just raise these. Now, if you've been noticing, these algorithms are incredibly powerful and they're very easy to implement. Let's go back to what we've had before, and this was in the last lecture, when we were applying both Gaussian mixture models as well as linear discriminant analysis, um, uh, those, those methods, as well as naive Bayes. So all those basically required a training set and a test set. So remember, just to refresh your memory, the training set is going to be made up of 50 dogs on top of 50 cats. So <coughs> I've randomly sampled 50 dogs, 50 cats, and since it's a training algorithm, I've actually given it labeled it ones and twos. So I'm, I'm labeling my data and in my test set, I'm gonna go put my test set in and see how well it can actually distinguish between dogs and cats, given that I trained it with 50 dogs and 50 cats. Now notice, one thing that's interesting about SVNs, uh, these uh, SVMs is that the support vector machine, it really is looking for these data points that form the support vector. In other words, what it can do potentially is train on very little data. And that's one of its big advantages because it really just needs the data that sits along the boundaries or near the edges. It doesn't have to have all that other data to form some statistics. It just needs these support vectors. And once it has the support vectors, it can train this classification separation. Okay? That's very different than a lot of the other algorithms which require to take statistics over all the data to form some kind of statistical ensemble, for instance, in Gaussian mixtures, where you can draw the data point. So training on a small amount of data really works your, to your disadvantage, where here you can potentially get away with training on a very small amount of data. Okay? So that's one of the advantages, and it's fairly fast. So let's go ahead and program this up. So it's pretty simple. Let's call this SVM. It's going to be a variable that comes out of this. It's going to be called SVM train. And I put in my training data and my labels. That's pretty much it. So what's going to come out of here is this variable called SVM. I throw in my training data here through SVM train, so it's going to be support vector machine train. Throwing in my training data and its labels. And once I have that, I can now basically take that and then test it out. Okay? So let's go test this out. So my results uh, from this, let's call it my predictor, pre-re, that's what I called it before. My predictor for this method is going to be basically the following, SMMs, SVM classify, that's a command in MATLAB, and all I got to do here is tell it to use the SVM and the test data. Oops, close. Okay. So what's going to happen here, SF, SVM classify is now going to go ahead and classify some new data using the output of this SVM train. So, right, so whatever comes out of this SVM train is going to be stuck here in SVM, and this is going to be my decision boundary, what my support vectors are, where my decision space is, and so I'm going to now take new test data and throw it in, and everything is going to come out in my test data as either ones or twos. It's going to label every point I put in is either dog or cat. That's what I've given it. So it's going to come back with that. So again, what we can do is just simply plot bar PRE. And what we know is the first 30 points are supposed to be ones, and the next 30 points are supposed to be twos. And we can look and see what we actually got on any single trial. So let's go ahead and run this. And this is what we get. Ah, come on. So this is the results. So again, the first 30 here are supposed to be all ones. They're all dogs. Here, this dog got misclassified as a cat. So did these four and this fifth one. So the big, basically five wrong out of the 30, okay? As far as the cats go, this uh, support vector is supposed to be all twos. So I got quite a few wrong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Something like 10, 10 wrong out of the 30. Okay, but this is a single trial, right? So I'm getting somewhere in the, you know, if you average this out, 70% accuracy. Again, we're only doing, when we're looking at this data, we're only looking at three features of the data. We're also not pre-processing the data to look at edges of the dogs and cats. We're just throwing the data in, looking in that cluster of space. And you can see, there's my accuracy. But again, this is one trial. What do you always have to do? Cross-validate. No matter what, cross-validate. So you'd run this trial 
many, many times and you look at your accuracy per trial, you'd average over the accuracy to get a score and look at the variance of your accuracy to kind of get some indication of how robust trial by trial is. Okay, let's run it one more time just to see the difference. Here's a new result. In this case, just by simply training, you know, switching the training set, picking another random 50 to another random 30, notice that I only get three, three of those uh, uh, cats wrong, whereas I got a few more dogs wrong. So again, this highlights the need to do the cross-validation step. It is imperative that you do it, okay? So don't ever take it for granted that you have to do cross-validation. It's important. Let's listen to Cam over here. Okay, that's my bobblehead cam, and I'm glad he could make it to class today. All right, so this is the sport vector machine. It is as easy as this. Now, uh, there are a lot of options for SVN in MATLAB, and I want to just show you this. I'm going to blow this up. Usually I don't do this so much, but let me just show you some things here. Help, SVN, uh, SVM, train. Okay, now when we do this, um, we're going to get some options here. Let's go over here. Let's actually pull this over and pull this over because we don't need it. We can go up here and look when we do the help. And there are a lot of options on SVN. If you can just look at this help menu, there's a ton of stuff here. Okay, so the basic thing with SVN, it's a sport, trains a sport vector machine, classifier, okay? All right, so it has some structure. It's going to give you back a structure. That's what this SVN variable was. It's a structure associated with the training steps. But there's a lot of options for this. And let's look at some of these. Ooh. So you can put in different parameters. And here are the things. You can put in the kernel function. So here, a string of function handles spe specifying the kernel used to represent the new space. All right, so here we go. You can start talking about a linear kernel. And the linear kernel is just basically a line fit. That's basically what we're using. It's the default. However, you can say I want to fit a quadratic through it, some kind of quadratic, which would be um, a parabolic shape, right? But look at that. You can do polynomials, uh, reduced. Uh, so this is Gaussian radial basis. These are really awesome. I'm not going to talk about these, but these are the kind of things that allow the SVN to be this amazing, uh, amazing workhorse of industry, okay? Uh, and you can see multi-layer perceptron kernel, uh, functional kernel specified by the user. This is an extremely, extremely powerful method. Uh, it is one of the workhorses that you find in industry, both support vector machines and uh, decision trees are probably the two most commonly used data analysis skills uh, at necessary. And you can you know, basically put over here as options these kind of things. If you want some kind of nonlinear classification structure where you have curved surfaces, whether it be polynomial, Gaussian uh, radial basis functions, quadratic, or a linear discriminator. And you can actually play around with that. And for certain types of data, this makes a lot of sense. And in fact, the example I drew with the circles on the inside and the dots on the outside is exactly the kind of thing you can do here by specifying those commands. It will draw you the circle that discriminates the inside from the outside of the data. Okay, so that's support vector machine.